In deep neural networks, one of the structure's core components is activation function inside neurons. These activation functions are an integral part of why the deep architecture works. The activation function comes in various shapes like sigmoid, tanh, relu, leaky relu, and dozens more. You might be asking yourself, why do we need activation functions in the first place in deep neural network? We'll figure this out shortly and show you a simple rule of thumb to use. In summary, the absence of nonlinear activation functions means the network can only learn linear functions, which is pretty bad. ReLU or its variants are usually good enough when you have to choose an activation function. Okay, so a definition. The activation function of a node in an artificial neural network is a function that calculates the output of the node based on its individual inputs and their weights. Let's figure out what that means with a single neuron example. So here's a single neuron. Something happened in here to modify x into y. Learning is stored in weights and they transform the input x. The transformation internally looks like this. It's linear for this first part. But this output isn't the final output of the neuron. The activation function comes right after the linear transformation and is the final output. So the whole output for a neuron is the formula y equal the function w times x plus b, where b is the bias. This is what, in a nutshell, this definition meant. Pretty simple. Now, this function y equal f of z can be of two kinds. It can be linear or nonlinear. Let's assume the function is linear. What will happen to a deep neural network if that's the case? Let's check with a simple tree neuron network example, which is considered deep, even though it's not very wide. The activation function we'll be using here will be a linear activation with slope of one. So we have input going to neuron one, then the output goes to neuron two, and finally the output goes to neuron three, which generate y. Each of these three neurons has its own set of learnable weights. Their output is z1, then z2, and then y for the last neurons, and their formula for z1, z2, and y are given below. Same thing as we saw with the single neuron example. Now, since the activation function is not changing its input, we can just omit it. And for this example, let's remove the biases for simplicity for the following steps. It doesn't change the conclusion at all. So starting from the end, the output y can be written as y equal w3 times z2 which can be simplified as y equal w3 times w2 times z1 because z2 is w2 times z1. Rearranging the term, we have w3 times w2 times z1. This means we want to multiply two weights together before multiplying the input z1. This is similar to having one big neuron where w4 equal w3 times w2. y is then just equal to w4 times z1. We can do the same on rolling and replace z1 with w1 times x. And we arrange again the term, we get w4 times w1 times x, which can then be simplified to w5 times x, where w5 equals w3 times w2 times w1. And this is bad because it means that there isn't a real depth in the network since we can rewrite it as a single layer network. With more neurons per layer and more layers, it will lead to the same conclusion, but with a larger formula to simplify. So these network with a linear activation function will still learn something, but only linearly separable planes, not nonlinear ones. Okay, so nonlinearity activations make the network deep and learn complex function. So which one should you use though? First, why is there so many of them? Let's do a very, very quick history of the activation functions. You will quickly see the pattern here. Sigmoid was the first nonlinearity widely used. The main reason it was selected is because its output is between 0 and 1, which resembles a not probability output. The issue with sigmoid is that it leads to the vanishing gradient problem. When the output gets close to 0 or 1, the gradient gets really, really small. Another issue is that we need to compute the exponent, which costs some runtime. Tanh was a bit better, but not by much, and still had the same issues as sigmoid because it has a similar shape. ReLU is a much simpler function and works amazingly well in deep networks. The gradient is either 0 or 1, so nothing complicated to compute here. 
However, a gradient of zero is bad as it leads to dying neuron because of how the backpropagation algorithm works. If you multiply stuff by zero, it will just not do anything. So other ReLU-like activation functions were created that fix up the negative portion of ReLU, like LU, JLU, Leaky ReLU, or Switch. What to remember from this whole history is that the development of activation function was a very, very iterative process. It wasn't optimal from the start. It was very experimental and the architecture changed over time. So they got deeper. So which one to choose then? Here's a very simple rule of thumb that kind of always work. Check the activation function of the state of the art for your use case and just use that. Don't try to get fancy with activation functions. If there's no state of the art for your specific use case, use ReLU and change to one of the variant if the learning is hurt by ReLU or by the deepness of your network. And that's kind of that. So I hope this quick video was useful. Don't forget to like the video if it was the case and leave a comment if you have any question. I'm here to help. Have a great week everyone and see you in the next video. By the way, I have a few uh, good blog posts in there on the description. So check it out if you want to learn more about the activation functions.